All right. Um, well, thank you again for having me. Um, I, now that I've moved to Kentucky, it's great to be able to come back to the area um, as much as possible, so I'm happy to be here. We're going to talk about the Supreme Court and last term, not, not the current term. We'll talk a little bit about what's happening this term at the end, but we're going to talk about last term and all the major decisions going on. Um, before I do that, I always like to sort of uh, set things in kind of a, how do we get to where we are right now? There's uh, the court in the last, um, oh, eight, ten years or so has undergone a lot of really substantial, significant changes um, in personnel and in, in, in sort of the dynamics of the court, popular opinion, all that kind of stuff. So uh, to kind of just get us to today and, and recap sort of what's happened. Everybody's familiar with the Warren Court. Um, the Warren Court, Earl Warren was appointed to the court uh, in 1953, but the Warren Court didn't really become the Warren Court the way we think of the Warren Court for eight or ten years um, after Warren was appointed to the court. Uh, it really wasn't until uh, LBJ appointed like Thurgood Marshall and Abe Fortas and stuff like that where the Warren Court really became the Warren Court that we, that we know of or in the way that we think of it. Um, and the, the big thing about the Warren Court is that it, it had six or maybe even seven really solid left-leaning justices, and so uh, its decisions, especially the hotly contested politicized decisions, tended to be big liberal court, liberal court decisions, and that's sort of how we envision the Warren Court. Uh, and then a bunch of stuff happened in 1968-69. Uh, uh, LBJ announced he was not going to run for re-election in 1968. Uh, Chief Justice Warren decided to resign to give LBJ the opportunity to appoint his successor before leaving office, and the Republican Party said, no, 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 you can't have a Supreme Court appointment during an election year. That might sound familiar. Um, so uh, there was a big hubbub about it. Uh, LBJ tried to appoint Abe Fortas as the new Chief Justice to replace Chief Justice Warren. Um, in the opposition to doing that, the Republicans dug up some dirt on Abe Fortas. Uh, one of the things they found is that he had taken some some gift money. Uh, that might sound familiar. <laughs> he had taken what was roughly equivalent to like $175,000 in, in gifts. He had actually given it back because he recognized that wasn't maybe kosher to do that. Um, but nevertheless, the scandal about it sort of forced him to resign. Um, Nixon gets elected in 1968, and as a result of all of this, Nixon walks into the presidency with two vacancies because Chief Justice Warren had resigned, and then Fortas' uh, appointment to be the replacement for Chief Justice Warren, uh, he was already on the court, and his uh, nomination to his, his resignation because of the scandal um, about the gift money and stuff like that, uh, that left another vacancy. So President Nixon had two vacancies when he walked in. Um, he made those two appointments, and a year later, uh, two of the other members of the court died within a month of each other. So Nixon, in his first two years in office, got four appointments on the Supreme Court. That was a huge shift, and we went from this liberal uh, Warren Court to the Burger Court, which now had five uh, conservative, a five-justice conservative majority on the Burger Court. But what happened in the 1970s is we, we entered this, this swing justice era. So. Uh, one of those justices that Nixon had appointed, Justice Powell, sort of emerged in the mid to late 70s as the swing justice. So there was a five justice conservative majority on the Burger Court, but Justice Powell would, would swing over to the side with the liberal justices uh, from time to time. And so suddenly we had this 5-4 uh, balance on the court with one justice in the middle swinging back and forth. Um, and that kind of, be, that was like a new thing. Um, when Justice O'Connor got appointed to the court in, in I think it's 1981-ish or something like that. Um, justice O'Connor became the new swing justice. She was a little more conservative than Justice Powell, but still would, would swing over with the liberal justices from time to time. Uh, she left the court in, I think, 2001-ish. Um, and uh, at that point, Justice Kennedy sort of took over as the new swing justice. He was a little more conservative than Justice O'Connor. So the center, the ideological center of the court, with Justice Powell in the middle, it was still a, a, a newly conservative court, but a sort of 1970s moderate Republican conservative court. Um, and then Justice O'Connor sort of shifted that center a little more to the right, but still, still was a swing justice 
on a lot of issues. And then Justice Kennedy moved the middle of the court even a little more to the right, but still would swing on um, certain issues um, like same-sex marriage and things like that. So this swing justice era lasted a long time. Um, you might remember 2016, in February of 2016, Justice Scalia passed away rather suddenly. Uh, there was that whole thing about you can't appoint a Supreme Court justice in an election year. <laughs> um, so Judge Garland, uh, who was nominated by President Obama, his nomination was blocked. Um, and we got uh, Justice Gorsuch when, when President Trump was elected that fall. Uh, instead of getting a Justice Garland to replace Justice Scalia. Now, had Garland replaced Scalia, that would have been a big shift, which is why the Republican Party blocked it, of course, uh, because we would have gone from a 5-4 court with a conservative-leaning swing justice with Justice Kennedy to a 5-4 court with a liberal-leaning swing justice with Justice Garland. Garland probably would have been a swing justice just tilting to the left instead of tilting to the right. Um, if not Garland, maybe Breyer. Breyer might have been, might have taken on sort of a new swing justice role because he's he was pretty moderate. Um, but instead, we got Justice Gorsuch who replaced Scalia, and and Gorsuch is very much in the vein of Scalia, so it didn't really change the balance of the court. Um, so Justice Kennedy continued as the swing justice, but then. Uh, in 2018, uh, Justice Kennedy, who was that swing justice, announced his resignation, and we got Justice Kavanaugh to replace him. That was the, the end of the swing justice era. So when Justice Kavanaugh replaced Justice Kennedy, uh, we now had a 5-4 court, but that fifth justice on the, on the conservative majority was no longer a swing justice. We had five solid conservative votes. Chief Justice Roberts was sort of identified as the middle justice, but he's, he wasn't a swinger. <laughs> he was... He was pretty solidly in the conservative side. He sided with the conservative justices like 92, 93% of the time. Um, so that 2018 replacement of Justice Kennedy really sort of marked a, a new shift in the balance of the court. Uh, then in 2020, uh, you'll remember Justice Ginsburg passed away uh, just before the election. Um, it's interesting, in 1968, it was not okay to appoint a Supreme Court justice in an election year. In 2016, it was not okay to do that, but in 2020, it was totally okay. <laughs> eight, weeks, eight weeks before the election, uh, they very quickly um, appointed and confirmed uh, Justice Barrett to replace Justice Ginsburg, um, and that uh, marked a, another shift, because instead of a 5-4 conservative majority, we now have a 6-3 to three conservative majority, Justice Barrett joining the other five conservatives and replacing the more liberal Ginsburg. Uh, and then just last year, of course, uh, Justice Breyer retired um, and was replaced by Justice Jackson. That's, that makes the liberal side of the court a little more liberal, because Justice Jackson is, I think, fair to say is, is more liberal than Justice Breyer was. Uh, but that still is just a three-justice liberal minority, so it doesn't change the balance of the court really at all. But we really are in this sort of new Roberts Court era, and it's really similar to the Warren Court. Warren, Warren, Chief Justice Warren was on the court for eight or ten years before the Warren Court really became the Warren Court. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts has been on the court since 2006, I think, was when he was appointed. Um, but really, it was 2018 where the Roberts Court became what I think historically will be known as the Roberts Court when we got uh, Kavanaugh and then Barrett and... Um, this new six justice majority and doing new things like overturning Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, big gun rights decisions, and then some of the decisions we're going to talk about today. So really big, big shifts in the court over the last several years, and sort of the big question is, you know, what's, after overturning Roe versus Wade and, you know, all these other big stuff, what else, what else is coming? What's next? Um, so before we get to the actual, oh, yeah, didn't talk, oh, the last thing I'll mention, too, the, the two oldest justices on the court are Justice Thomas and Justice Alito. Um, I mentioned the stuff about Abe Fortas. There has been a lot of controversy over the past year with Justice Thomas and receiving monetary gifts. Um, he's not going to resign. <laughs> There's no sign of him resigning. Um, Justice Thomas and Justice Alito are the two oldest justices, but they probably will not leave the court voluntarily under a Democratic president. Um, so the, the sixth justice majority will stay for the foreseeable future, it really is going to depend a lot on, on elections and, uh, I guess, health, <laughs> the health of the justices. But otherwise, we've kind of got this new Roberts Court for, for the foreseeable future. All right, so some numbers really quick. 
Um, this is, again, to put this in historical context, the court used to decide 150 to sometimes 200, pushing 200 cases every year, um, up until about the early 80s. Um, the, the conservative side of the court for decades has wanted the court to do less. Um, and a lot of that has come as kind of a reaction to the Warren Court, which was very active and deciding a lot of, again, liberal-leaning decisions. And so the conservative side of the court has sort of felt like the Supreme Court should not do so much. Um, and in the 1980s, when Chief Justice Rehnquist was appointed, he sort of took the lead in trying to make that happen by deciding fewer cases. He sort of led the court into this era of we're going to decide fewer. So under Chief Justice Rehnquist, the number of decisions went from 150 to 200 down to around 100 every term. When Chief Justice Roberts became the chief, um, he, he clerked for Rehnquist. He had sort of the same idea. And that number went from 100 cases a year down to like 90 or even 80 or maybe 75. And then over the last several years, it got down to even in the 60s. Last term, it was 57. Um, over the last few years, the court has set new records for the lowest, fewest number of decisions since the Civil War. <laughs> um, so the court is definitely doing less. It's doing more with the decisions, you know, overturning Roe versus Wade is a big deal. So it's doing a lot more in terms of substance, but a lot less in terms of quantity. Um, and the numbers just don't lie. 57 cases, the court gets eight to 10,000 petitions every year. So do the math. I don't know what that percentage is, but it's less than 1%. Um, if you file a petition at the Supreme Court, your chances aren't great. <laughs> um, the uh, percentage in terms of breakdown, so over the last 10 years, the court has averaged a fairly significant percentage of decisions that are unanimous. So we, as much attention as the divisions on the court get, it's good to remember that like there are a lot of cases that get decided unanimously. The court agrees on a lot of stuff. It tends to be like not headliner stuff, right? It's you know some bankruptcy case or procedural issue or you know other kinds of things that uh, are not headline grabbing kind of things. But over the last 10 years, about 43% of the decisions have been unanimous. This last term, that jumped up a little bit. 47% of the cases were decided unanimously, which is, that's a lot. Uh, that's almost half of the decisions being decided 9-0. So that's worth remembering when we're thinking about the court, because we do tend to think about it mostly in terms of that ideological division. Um, we did used to average, uh, over the last 10 years or so, about 25% of the cases being five to four. Again, most of that time period was with the swing justice, so you had a lot of five, four decisions with Justice Kennedy going one way or the other. Um, that has changed now. Uh, last term, we had 21, which is almost the average of 25%, but those were not five, four decisions, they were six, three decisions, with mostly with that typical six conservatives versus three liberals. And la the year before this last year, uh, it was actually 30%. That was the first full year with Justice Barrett on the court. Um, and that first full term with the six justice majority, there were 30% of the decisions decided 6-3. So the, con the new conservative majority really sort of flexed its muscles that first year with Justice Barrett. Um, and then uh, this last year still continued 21%, 6-3 decisions. We still get 5-4 decisions. 12% were 5-4. to four. Um, Most of those 5-4 decisions now, they're, they're on, like, again, a procedural case or a bankruptcy case or something like that. And there's, there's not a political or ideological divide. It's really more of a jumbled 5-4 justices disagreement. And you have, like, two liberals and three conservatives with, on one side with one liberal and three other conservatives on the other side. So it's kind of a jumbled 5-4, not the ideological 5-4s we used to get. Most of the cases that are ideological now are 6-3. Um, there's no swing justice, no middle justice, really. Uh, we have Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch. They all can sometimes swing over with the liberals on certain issues. But there's nobody who really is like a consistent uh, swing justice in any meaningful sense of, of the word. Um, the liberal justices, because there's only three of them, they have to always get at least two of the conservatives to swing over with them. It does happen once in a while. Those two who tend to be the two uh, most often are Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh. 
Um, but there have been, like, there was one case a uh, year or two ago where it was Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Gorsuch who had joined the liberals. Uh, there was a 5-4 case this term that we won't talk about, but um, Justice Thomas actually joined the liberals so that it was one of the 5-4 decisions, and the four were the three liberals and Thomas, which is weird, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it happens. <laughs> So, so all of the justices really are capable of, of swinging over with the liberals. But again, it's, it's, there's not really any consistent swing. It's, it's, six, it's a 6-3 court pretty solidly. All right, so to talk about the actual cases, uh, the first case we'll talk about is the First Amendment. Uh, this is Jack Daniels versus VIP products. This is a, I don't know if you can see um, this, but this is a parody case. Um, this. Jack Daniels whiskey bottle, um, which hopefully you're not too familiar with, but, but you're, <laughs> you're familiar with. Um, the, the other bottle is not a bottle of any kind of liquid. It's a, it's a dog, it's a squeaky dog toy, <laughs> okay? And it says bad spaniels instead of Jack Daniels. And instead of old number seven Tennessee sour mash whiskey, it says the old number two on your Tennessee carpet. Um, and, it, and it, like I said, it's a squeaky dog toy. It's, it's not a bottle of liquid. But nevertheless, uh, Jack Daniels didn't like this and sued the toy maker for trademark infringement. And the toy maker said, hey, you know, this is like parody, right? The First Amendment protects parody. Um, so we can't, trademark law can't prevent us from doing this because we have a First Amendment right to sort of do parody type stuff. Um, and that's sort of generally true, and that was the main question in the case, is whether or not um, this is a, a First Amendment protected kind of thing, or if trademark law really can get this toy company to stop producing these toys. Um, and one of the big debates in the case is over, like parody will tend to be in the sphere of politics or art, right? So you have one movie that's parodying another movie, or you get political parody. Um, that's where the parody tends to exist, is in the political or the artistic sphere. But this is really just straight up commercial product, right? This is not politics, it's not art, it's, it's a product, it's a commercial product. So the question is, does, does the, ex, this First Amendment protection for parody, does it extend into the commercial sphere like this? And, and in trademark law, and I'm not a trademark lawyer, uh, so this is my rudimentary understanding, but the big question for Justice Kagan in this case, because what the court ends up saying unanimously, this is one of the court's unanimous decisions, Justice Kagan says, the First Amendment does not protect this kind of parody. And the reason is, uh, most parody is a form of expression where you're expressing something uh, in a parody uh, mode, but, but, and there's no question about source. The problem here is you have the risk of confusion about source because the Jack Daniels trademarks tells you this bottle of Jack Daniels is coming from Jack Daniels. We're the ones putting this out. And the toy company is using the trademarks in a way that could create confusion for who it is that's putting this out because it's using, it's using trademarks uh, in a way that might indicate source as opposed to just an expression. Now, personally, I'm not sure anyone's confused about whether or not Jack Daniels is putting out the dog toy that says Bad Spaniels, but nevertheless, that's the court's ruling. So uh, there is at least, and this is early stages of this case, so there's at least a plausible claim that this violates trademark law. Now, whether in the actual trial of the case and you know, going through the whole process, whether this is found to be an actual violation of trademark law, we don't know yet, but the court has at least said it could be. And so there's a plausible claim for a violation of trademark law. The First Amendment doesn't kill the claim in its tracks, in other words. So interesting First Amendment case about parody, and at least in the commercial sphere. Um, another more serious First Amendment case is uh, about stalking um, and, and true threats. So in this case, uh, Mr. Counterman, uh, there was a, 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 an emerging up-and-coming country singer in Colorado who uh, was becoming fairly popular, starting to get uh, a little bit of a, of a fan following. And Mr. Counterman became a fan um, and started stalking uh, this country singer through Facebook posts. And, and she would try to block him, and he would just create another account and keep sending her messages. 
And she, it actually began to affect her mental health. She um, ultimately shut down things, moved to the East Coast to get away. Um, she described his messages as menacing. At least one of his messages talked about how she should die. It, it, it sounded pretty menacing. Um, he was prosecuted for stalking. And under Colorado law, um, part of that prosecution included the speech, the, included the messages that he was sending to her. Um, and so the question, he, he was convicted and he was sentenced to four and a half years in prison um, under this stalking statute. But the, he challenged this conviction um, asserting First Amendment protection for his speech, at least for that component of the conviction where it was getting at him for, for the speech, these messages that he was sending. He was saying there's a First Amendment protection for this. And of course, the question under the First, under First Amendment is true threats, quote unquote true threats, are not protected by the First Amendment. So the question becomes, were these messages he was sending true threats? Because if they were, they're not protected by the First Amendment and his conviction is fine. If they were not true threats, then, he, then it's protected speech and he can't be convicted based on that speech. Um, and the question that emerges in the case is, what's the proper standard for determining whether something is a true threat or not? Uh, because we have to determine that before we can determine whether the First Amendment protects this speech. And what the Colorado courts had done is they had applied a reasonable person standard. So if a reason, in other words, an objective standard. If a reasonable person would think that this is a threat, then that's a threat and, and that's not protected by the First Amendment. And, under that reasonable person objective standard, the Colorado courts had found this was a true threat, um, therefore it's not protected by the First Amendment, therefore he can be convicted. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, that question about whether or not the proper test was applied is what goes up to the Supreme Court. And uh, if you listen to the oral argument in this case, you would come out of it thinking nobody on the court knows what they're going to say about this case, and we're probably going to get something really messy, and nobody's going to understand what it constitutes a true threat and what doesn't. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Um, the court, in a 7-2 decision uh, written by Justice Kagan, said the proper standard here is not the objective reasonable person standard. Instead, it's a subjective recklessness standard. And what that means in application is if you know, if you subjectively know that other people might take this as a threat and you continue to say that thing anyway, then you could be, that, that could be a true threat and you could be convicted for that. Even if you didn't intend to threat, it's not an intent uh, standard, you might not have intended a threat, but if you know people could take it that way and you continue to say it, then that sort of rec recklessness could get you convicted. That will not be pr uh, protected by the First Amendment. So uh, that new standard uh, for true threats is, that's now the law. Um, there, there was a dissent from uh, Justice Thomas and Justice Barrett not saying um, that there should be any greater protection, but in actually saying there should be less. Uh, Justice Thomas's dissent actually said we should question the New York Times uh, versus Sullivan decision and have a lot less First Amendment protection for speech in general. So interesting opinions about First Amendment stuff um, in that case. Uh, the other big First Amendment case, and this is a really big First Amendment case, is the 303 um, creative case. You probably heard a little bit about this. It's kind of a uh, similar, had echoes of the, the cake baking case from a few years ago. Um, this also came out of Colorado. Uh, a website designer um, wanted to be able to create wedding web pages, but wanted to be able to market those wedding web pages only to opposite sex couples and not for same sex couples. Um, and Colorado's anti-discrimination law says you can't do that. Um, so, so she uh, brought a case and said, I, I wanna be able to do this and said that the anti-discrimination law was violating her First Amendment rights. And the way that this got covered um, and the way most people sort of came at this case is thinking that this is about freedom of religion, right? That her religious beliefs were against same-sex marriage and she wanted, to, um, she wanted to be able to protect her religious rights by not having to cater to same-sex couples. Um, but what she really, what she actually brought was a First Amendment challenge based on speech, saying that this is compelled speech. If I'm being forced to provide web, wedding websites or wedding web pages for same-sex couples, then I'm being compelled to, to express speech that I don't want to express. So the question is whether or not that anti-discrimination law compels speech in a way that violates the First Amendment. Uh, the court 
Oh, there, were, there was a late controversy in this case. Um, the case had been argued, but it hadn't yet been decided, and it sort of came out that no same-sex couple had actually ever asked her to create a web page. Uh -huh. And so everyone was like, oh, wait, does, does she even have standing and stuff like that? And, and it kind of created a, a last-minute like controversy. It turns out like it was a, a non-controversy because she wanted to market her web page services, and she wanted, as part of her marketing, she wanted to be able to say, this is not, you know, this is only for opposite sex couples, not for same sex couples. And so her claim was the anti discrimination law was chilling her speech, you know, preventing her from being able to market the way she wants to market. So she absolutely has standing to do that. Even though nobody had actually asked her to create the web page, she still was being restricted by the, by the law that was in place. But it did create a little bit of a stir. Everyone's like, why is the court even hearing this case? And, but anyway, uh, in the end, 6-3 uh, decision uh, with the, this sort of typical ideological breakdown. Justice Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion. And the court says, yes, this anti-discrimination restriction does violate the First Amendment. Her First Amendment rights to speech, not religion, speech. Now, the reason that's a really big deal is uh, it's not based on religious belief. You don't have the same hoops to jump through, right? You have to, for, for religious protections, you have to show you know, a sincere, sincerely held belief, and there has to be some, like, you can't just claim to have a religious belief about anything. There has to be some, you know, some proof involved that this is actually a religious belief. Here, none of that's required, right? I just don't want to have to say anything in support of interracial, interracial marriages, so I don't want to create web pages for interracial couples. Right? Speech as the basis for this is a much bigger deal than religion because it's much more far reaching. So I think that we'll see a lot more cases coming up where people are saying, I don't want to have to do this because I don't want to have to say that. Now, the one thing that does kind of cabin this case is it's about expressive activity. And that was one of the things early on in the case where both sides stipulated that this creating these web pages was an expressive activity. Now, I think that personally, I think that's where they went wrong here, because I think if your company hires a web developer to make the company website, nobody thinks that's the web developer's speech. They think it's the company's speech. And I think in this case, if the web page was the couple's web page, it was the couple's speech about their wedding and not the web page de designer speech, then we wouldn't have a case here, right? But instead, because it's being construed as expressive activity for the web page designer, and she doesn't want to make that speech, First Amendment protects her from having to do that, and, uh, and we may seem, see the court trying to sort of refine what they did here, because this could open big doors to a lot of other challenges. If something could be construed as expressive activity, anti-discrimination laws can no longer prevent people from companies, businesses, from saying discriminatory stuff or doing discriminatory things. So really, really big case in the First Amendment and anti-discrimination law uh, sphere. Um, Fourth Amendment. Uh, for the last 10 years, the court has had two, three, sometimes five big Fourth Amendment cases every year for like a long time. There's always lots of stuff to say about searches and seizures and excessive force and all that kind of stuff. For some, there were lots of really good, strong cert petitions raising really important issues. We actually, while I was still practicing, we had a, a really important knock and talk case about whether or not a 2 a.m. knock and talk was lawful. Like, can you really go knock on someone's door at 2 o'clock in the morning as a, under a knock and talk exception? So there were lots of opportunities for the court to take Fourth Amendment cases, and they just didn't take any. And nobody knows why. And it's really weird, because they've been saying a lot about the Fourth Amendment for a lot of years, every year, and they just didn't. So nothing. Um, Fifth Amendment, Eighth Amendment. So this is a fun case um, in Minnesota. Um, this little old lady in Minnesota uh, lives in a condo, and she starts getting old, older where she can't really live on her own, so she goes to a, an assisted living facility, but she keeps her condo. But um, over time, she lapses on paying the property taxes on the condo, and she's living in her assisted living facility, and eventually she runs up this tax bill on the condo, and the county... Uh, comes in and seizes the property, and under state law or, or county ordinances or whatever it is, 
the, there's a forfeiture scheme in place where if you are delinquent on taxes, you're, you forfeit your property, the, the government can come in, seize the property, then they can sell off the property to pay the back taxes, and it's just all sort of, you know, this is just how we do this, right? It's a, there's just a forfeiture scheme for recovering due taxes. Um, the problem is that her condo was worth about $50,000. She owed about $15,000 in taxes. They seized the property, they sold it off, they paid the taxes, and they kept the remainder. So grandma sues and says, hey, I, you know, some of that money's mine. <laughs> and the question in the case, is, and the state says, hey, um, or the county, the county says, no, under the forfeiture scheme, you have forfeited your right in the property, so you no longer have any right in whatever the property, it doesn't matter what the property's worth, under the scheme, you forfeit the property by being delinquent on taxes. So once that property is forfeited, we seize the property and it's just ours, whatever it's worth. And we could sell it for the exact amount that the taxes are owed on it. And since we could do that, it doesn't matter that we sell it for more. We just own the property now because you've forfeited it. Now, that's actually a stronger argument than it might seem at first blush, right? Like, if you don't own the property anymore because you forfeited it, then you don't have any claim to the excess amount after it's been sold, which means there's no problem with the takings clause. And the other argument she raised was the Eighth Amendment excessive fines clause, that you sort of, you, you fined me excessively by basically taking $50,000 from me instead of 15. But the argument against that was, no, there's no punitive fine here. This is a remedial forfeiture scheme where you owe us money and to remediate that debt, we seize the property and we sell it whatever we can sell it for to just recover the debt that you owe us. There's no punishment involved. So if there's no punishment, there can't be an excessive fine. So it actually raises some really interesting questions about the takings clause and the excessive fines clause. Um, but it still is grandma against the government. <laughs> and it doesn't feel right. <laughs> so the court, um, I've already talked about this. So the question is whether she retains rights um, in the property or if she's forfeited all of that. And then there's the remedial versus punitive. The court unanimously says, Grandma wins this, right? I mean, seriously, <laughs> seriously, we can't go taking thousands of dollars from Grandma. So the court, uh, and Roberts' opinion, doesn't really spend any time on the Eighth Amendment, really focuses on the takings clause and says, look, even though there's this forfeiture scheme, she still retains some right in the value of the property. Yes, yeah, sure, they can come in and try to recover the back taxes, but they can't Keep, they can't keep the excessive remainder that was left over after they sold the property. That's a takings problem. So grandma wins, unanimously. Um, all right, the next big case is uh, Article 1 slash 10th Amendment slash 14th Amendment, really complicated case involving uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA. Um, so a little bit of history about this. Um, for decades and decades, a lot of states, maybe all the states, let's say most, most of the states had really terrible policies when it came to uh, Native American children and, and the Native American, tri Native American tribes on, in, in the state uh, boundaries and on reservations. And there were actual like active efforts to deplete tribal membership and deplete, uh, forced assimilation. And these policies included things like taking children from Native American families and adopting them out to other families to sort of force, forcibly assimilate them into you know, white culture uh, and to deplete tribal membership and tribal power and things like that. Terrible policies. Uh, this goes on for decades and decades. Um, in the late 1970s, Congress says, we need to fix this. Um, so, there's a federal statute passed called ICWA that essentially um, attempts to stop this from happening. And it does a whole bunch of things. It creates some placement preferences. Um, it, it requires record keeping. Uh, it, it, it sort of orchestrates how custody hearings have to be done. It does a whole bunch of stuff uh, to, try to, to try to govern the way Native American children are um, uh, taken from families and adopted out to other families. And like, so for example, the placement preferences, it, it's a federally imposed requirement that the children be placed, if at all possible, with a tribal family member. Um, and if not, then with 
some other tribal family, even if they're not family members, a, they, they're members of the tribe, at least, so that the child doesn't get taken out away from the tribe. Um, now, the, the first amendment, or the, sorry, the article first, article one challenge uh, to this is whether or not, Cong whether this exceeds Congress's legislative power under the, there's the Indian Commerce Clause. So there's the Commerce Clause, and then there's another clause about Congress having the ability to regulate commerce with the Indian tribes. And by the way, Indian is not the preferred term politically, but legally it's, it's the term in the law. And since we're all strict textualists now, like you can't not say Indian, because if we just say, hey, we're not gonna do that anymore, this is Native American or indigenous peoples, then suddenly, well, the statute applies to Indians, <laughs> and if you say they're Native American or indigenous people, the statute no longer protects them, right? Because that's how strict textualism works, which is stupid. But that's what we do. So now, in the legal sphere, we still use Indian, even though it's not the preferred term, because legally, that's the term, and you know, Let's face it, we can't get Congress to do anything really big and important. They're not going to go back and amend every statute and treaty to say Native American instead of Indian. So I apologize for using the term that's not the best political term, but it is the legal term. Um, the the uh, challenge here is that under the Indian Commerce Clause, uh, whether or not Congress under that clause has the power to actually enact this kind of statute because uh, there's questions about whether this is commerce, <laughs> right? These are kids. Um, the Tenth Amendment challenge is the, so there's the anti-commandeering clause in the Tenth Amendment that says basically the federal government can't come in and force states to do certain kinds of things. Well, this federal statute comes in and tells the state, family law is, is historically, traditionally, uh, that's a state law sphere. The states govern family law. But here, the federal government is coming in and telling states how to do stuff when it comes to family law. And so there's a big question about whether that uh, violates the anti-commandeering provisions of the 10th Amendment. And then there's the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, where like, things like the placement preference could be construed as a, a racial preference, right? You're trying to place uh, this child with, a certain, with certain couples that have preference over other couples based on what some would argue is a racial preference. So th there's the argument that that violates Fourth Amendment equal protection uh, because it's a, it's a race thing. Now, the, uh, on, that, on that race issue, um, the counter argument is that this is all under federal statutes and treaties where the tribes, this is not about race, this is about political entities, right? This is about a federally recognized sovereign entity. The tribe is a sovereign nation so it's, it's more like having a relationship with another country and people who are members or citizens of that other country. And it's not about race, it's just about the political entity. And in fact, the, the, one of the things that supports that argument is there are tribes that are not recognized by federal statute as tribes, and they are not protected by ICWA. So uh, the argument against it being a racial preference is that this, is, this has nothing to do with race. It has to do with the political entities recognized by statute and protected by statute. Lots of different issues here, super complicated. At the district court, the district, the, the case, it arose here in Texas. Uh, it was taken to a particular federal district judge who is a favorite um, among certain challengers to federal laws. That district judge ruled everything was unconstitutional about ICWA under all of the, uh, all of the challenges that were brought. It was all unconstitutional. It went to the Fifth Circuit and it was reversed. Uh, the Fifth Circuit then took it en banc and the en banc Fifth Circuit split the baby. Um, and they said some things were un unconstitutional and some things weren't unconstitutional. This resulted in four cert petitions from different parties going to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took the case. And the court said in a 7-2 uh, decision by Justice Barrett, uh, no, none of this is unconstitutional. <laughs> There's no problem with the Article I power for Congress to, to legislate this way. There's no problem with the Tenth Amendment anti-commandeering thing. It's okay, the federal government can come in and, and do what it's doing here and it's not violating the Tenth Amendment. And then when it comes to the 14th Amendment, equal protection, race versus political entity stuff, none of the parties who are trying to bring that challenge have standing to bring that challenge. Um, 
And we all know standing just is like, does the court want to decide this case or not? That's the test for standing. <laughs> That's the official like black letter law. Does the court want to decide this? Yes, they have standing. No, they don't have standing. So the court says nothing's unconstitutional and the 14th Amendment stuff, there's no standing for that. Uh, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, both dissent. They think that their big concern, Thomas and Alito's big concerns were the, the federal intrusion into state law sphere. Um, that's, the, that's the main thing that they thought there was a problem with. Justice Kavanaugh wrote a concurring opinion. He, he, he agreed with the majority on the nothing being unconstitutional, but he said, I think there really are some serious 14th Amendment problems on the, the race preference kind of stuff, but he, he agreed that there was no standing for that kind of stuff with any of the parties that were there. Um, that's uh, potentially concerning uh, because they don't reach that issue. That means that future challenges to ICWA based on the 14th Amendment stuff are certainly going to be forthcoming by parties that have a stronger claim to standing than the parties that were in this case. Um, and at least Justice Kavanaugh has expressed openly um, that he, he's got concerns about that. Anyway, huge, huge uh, Native American law case. There's been several of these over the last few years. Um, it is really interesting to note Justice Gorsuch uh, has sort of emerged as like the big champion of Native American rights and Native American sovereignty and all kinds of stuff like that. So that's one of the areas where he will swing over with the liberal justices and side with them on Native American issues. He, he did that here. He wrote a big, he wrote a concurring opinion in this case where he sort of lays out the history uh, leading up to ICWA and why ICWA was so necessary and why it's so important. Um, so Justice Gorsuch on Native American um, law ha has sort of um, established himself as like a big proponent of Native American rights. All right, um, the next cases are uh, the administrative law. So I think that we should declare a moratorium in all the law schools nationwide and not teach administrative law for the next couple of years. And let's just say, hey, let's wait until the dust settles. <laughs> And when we all know what administrative law actually is again, we can start teaching it. Because we've had, over the last couple of years, big administrative law cases, and we got a couple more big ones. And this term right now that we're in, which we're not talking about, but we will next year, <laughs> this is like the administrative law term that we're in right now. So like I said, I think we should just like press the pause button on administrative law in law schools. Uh, the first one from last term is the Biden. This is the student debt relief case, there were a couple cases combined, um, consolidated here. Uh, if, if you remember, the Biden administration issued this, um, well, the, the Department of Education issued this debt relief program, right, where they were going to essentially forgive $430 billion of student debt. Um, and then that was immediately challenged um, by some states as well as some students. Um, not, not actual students, but I, you know, former students. Um, and the question is whether or not this exceeded executive power. You know, does, does the Biden administration have the power to do this, to just forgive $430 billion worth of student debt? Uh, one of the big questions in the case was, uh, again, standing. Uh, in other words, one of the big questions is, does the court want to decide this case? <laughs> um, there's a question about the states, like why do the states have standing to, to challenge this, right? The, the states don't have debt, student debt. Well, it turns out actually some of the states, uh, they, they run the, the student loan programs within the state, and so they are arguably affected by the, what's being done to the student debt program. Uh, and then the question about the borrowers was, hey, um, I'm not sure you're injured <laughs> by the forgiveness of your debt, <laughs> or, or if you're a student who already repaid your debt and now you're complaining that others are getting their debt forgiven, I'm not sure how the forgiveness of someone else's debt hurts you. So there's a real question about the borrowers and whether they, were, whether they had standing in any way. Um, and then the other big thing in the case, and this is the big administrative law issue, is this major questions doctrine, which emerged over the last year or two as a big new thing in, and it's not technically new, but it's being used in some fun new ways to do stuff with administrative law. And the major questions doctrine basically says, if Congress is going to legislate in an area where they are giving power to agencies to do certain things, and then the agencies are gonna go do that, those things, if the thing that they're legislating about is a major question, then Congress has to be really specific and detailed about what kind of power they're giving to the agency in order for us to determine whether the agency has actually been authorized to do that thing. 
Does that make sense? <laughs> now, what constitutes a major question? I think the test for that is, does the court think it's a major question? <laughs> yes or no? Uh, that's the big criticism of the major questions doctrine, is it kind of is just up to the court whether this is a major question. And that's the question that's in this case. Is the forgiveness of student loan debt, does that constitute a major question? And if so, did Congress legislate specifically enough in a way that gives the Department of Education the authority to forgive a bunch of debt? Or did the Department of Education exceed its authority? So that's the question. Uh, the court unanimously, in one of the cases, says no standing for those borrowers, because you're not hurt by the forgiveness of debt. But the states do get standing. And the court says, six to three, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, the Biden administration did exceed its authority. This is a major question, and there is not specific enough legislation to grant this kind of specific authority to, to the agency. And so the agency has exceeded its authority by doing this, and you can't do that. Now, this is a really big deal, not just for all of us who thought, hey, I'm going to get $10,000 of debt forgiven. but. Really big deal in administrative law because it's another example of that major questions doctrine kicking in and curbing the power of administrative agencies. That's the big shift with the Roberts Court is that there's been a real shift toward curbing or undermining administrative power for pretty much all the administrative agencies. And we're going to see, I think, a lot more of this major questions doctrine, these kinds of arguments being made about all kinds of agency decisions. We saw, I think, the first place it arose was in the Clean, Clean Water Act, I think, case a year or two ago. Um, but now it's, it's here with the Department of Education. We'll see it in other, in other spheres as well when we're dealing with administrative agencies. Major questions doctrine is, is going to be a big new thing that um, will be a strong way of challenging agency action. Um, the other big administrative case was the Axon uh, case. This one is, um, again, not a new thing, but a thing being used in new ways. Um, so, uh, we're all at least a little bit familiar with the, the exhaustion doctrine, right, which says like if you want to challenge something an agency's done, you have to exhaust the administrative agency, or the administrative remedies before you can go to court to challenge what the agency's doing. So the question, these were two cases that were brought together. Uh, one was challenging the SEC and one was challenging the FTC. And the, so when Congress passes legislation that creates the agency and then also delegates power to the agency to do stuff and then also creates a judicial review scheme so that if you want to challenge what the agency did, you have to exhaust those administrative remedies before you can go to court. The question in these cases was, does that displace the federal court's original uh, federal question jurisdiction if the challenge you're bringing is not to something that the SEC or the FTC did, but it, you're challenging the actual existence of the SEC <laughs> or the actual existence of the FTC. You think that they, they're structured wrong or they're, uh, they shouldn't be there. <laughs> and if that's the kind of challenge you're bringing, do you have to exhaust administrative remedies before you can go to court to bring that challenge? That's the question in this case, consolidated cases. And there's this old precedent from the early 90s that says the federal courts still have federal question jurisdiction over federal questions. Um, and that's not displaced by the administrative scheme that requires exhaustion before going to the court to review things. So depending on what the thing is you're challenging, you may have to exhaust administrative remedies, or you may be able to go straight to federal court under federal question, under federal question jurisdiction. Uh, the court unanimously. Justice Kagan writes for the unanimous court saying, under this old precedent, federal question jurisdiction is not displaced by the judicial review scheme in the statutes, which means you can bring a challenge to the existence of the SEC directly in federal court. You don't have to go exhaust administrative remedies before you do that, because that's just a federal, it is a federal question whether or not uh, Congress had power to enact a statute that creates the SEC, right? That's just a federal question. Now, the reason this is, it's not a new thing, because it's a, it's a, there's this old early 90s precedent that says, of course, federal question jurisdiction still exists. That's not new. But using it to challenge the very existence of administrative agencies is new. <laughs> so this is a fairly predictable decision in administrative law 
but it's a tool that's being used in lots of new ways to challenge the existence, of, the existence of agencies. And by not having to go through administrative remedies first and just going straight to federal court, those challenges can be brought more quickly and get to the Supreme Court more quickly. And it's a new Supreme Court that is now more open to a challenge of the very existence of administrative agencies. So big deal, even though it's not breaking new ground technically, it's breaking new ground in terms of policy and, and um, activist lit, uh, litigation, stuff like that. Uh, all right, uh, the other big case, I won't say a lot about this because this one was on all the headlines and everybody kind of already knows about it, um, but after overturning Roe versus Wade and then issuing big cases on gun rights, the next big thing from last term was uh, doing away with affirmative action. Uh, two cases, one against Harvard, one against the University of North Carolina. The reason for that is one's a state school, one's a private school, and they have to be able to uh, you know, challenge these, uh, these affirmative action programs in both public and private schools. Um, so these two cases come up to the court. The question is just, should the court overrule uh, the, its precedents uh, that allow for affirmative action? And um, the court, whoops, the court six to three, uh, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, says yes, affirmative action programs violate the 14th Amendment and Title VI. Uh, so precedent has all the power that the court gives it. Uh, and this court, so actually if you, it gets tricky uh, quantitatively uh, because it depends a lot on how you characterize precedent and what you characterize as an overturning of precedent. Because there are a lot of times where the court will effectively overrule a precedent without saying it's overruling the precedent. Um, and so do you count that as overruling precedent or not? But people have tried to do quantitative studies to see if the Roberts Court is overturning precedent more than prior courts. And my sense of the consensus is that it's not. Uh, they, are, they are overruling precedent in big ways, right? Like qualitatively, Roe versus Wade is a huge precedent that's been overruled, and that's a big deal. But in terms of numbers, the, the frequency with which they're overruling precedent, they might not be doing it more frequently than prior courts have done it. But again, a lot of it depends on how you, how you characterize precedent, how you characterize overruling, stuff like that. Um, this is another case where some pretty big precedents were overturned, though. Gruder and Bakke are you know, pretty standard law school cases that everybody learns, and now you will only learn them as a historically interesting thing that no longer exists. There's also a lot of argument or debate about whether, how much real world impact this has because so many challenges to affirmative action have been brought over the last 15 or 20 years that most schools have tried to move away from overt um, use of race as a factor. They've tried to move toward things that are proxies for that, you know, socioeconomic status, uh, rural versus urban, you know, things like that. So because schools have been trying to get away from using race overtly as a factor because they've been trying to avoid all these challenges over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, there's some question about whether or not doing away with the ability to use race as a factor really is gonna have much of an impact on admissions programs because they've already been trying to move away from doing it overtly anyway. Now, we don't really know and we probably won't know for a while, it'll take some years before we have any idea as to how much impact this actually has on admissions and, and student body uh, uh, diversity and composition. Um, so we won't really know for a while what the impact is, but people are, there are people saying it might not have that much real world impact because schools want diverse student bodies and they're finding other ways to get diverse student bodies without re relying overtly on race. Um, all right, last uh, but not least for sure is the voting rights cases. Uh, the Milligan case, Alabama, has a 27% African-American population. Uh, they have seven congressional districts. Um, the Republican legislature in Alabama drew those districts so that one out of the seven uh, was a majority black district and the other six out of the seven were majority white districts. Uh, this is the cracking and packing that you get with, with redistricting where they, uh, you have certain populations, whether it's a political party population or a racial population or a uh, sometimes gender population, whatever, whatever population they're targeting, uh, you, you 
you crack or pack. In other words, you, you break that population into small bits so that they don't have much voting. They're spread out over multiple districts so they don't have much voting power. Or you pack those populations into one district so they can just vote in that district and not affect other districts. So through that cracking and packing, they got this one out of seven uh, uh, minority majority district in Alabama. And that was challenged, and the district court which was a three-judge, so a lot of these election law cases are brought before a three-judge panel. The three-judge panel had two Trump appointees on it and still held that this was a pretty clear violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, by the way, uh, Shelby County, you remember from, I don't what is that, 2015? I don't know, somewhere in the teens. Uh, Shelby County was the case where the fifth, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was basically held unconstitutional, which means Section 2 is the only tool left until Congress, uh, which I'm sure they're, they're going to do any day now. They're going to update the Voting Rights Act. It's, it's, it's going to happen any day. Um, but right now, Section 2 is all there is to try to challenge this kind of stuff because of Shelby County. Um, and there have been some decisions in prior years that have really weakened Section 2. So this case, there was a challenge to... Uh, the redistricting plan in Alabama, but also a challenge to, from the other side, to Section 2 and, and an attempt to, again, whittle away at the ability of Section 2 to, uh, to govern these kinds of redistricting plans. Uh, the district court said this clearly violates the, the Voting Rights Act, Section 2. The appeal goes directly to the Supreme Court from the three-judge panel of the district court. Um, one of the things that the Supreme Court did, we talked about cracking and packing, one of the things the Supreme Court did, this, this gets to the Supreme Court eight months before the 2022 election. Of course, 2020, you know, those mid-year elections, you still have all the con congressional representatives are being reelected or not. Um, this gets to the Supreme Court eight months before the election, and the court blocks the district court's ruling and says, we're going to stay the ruling until we can consider the case, which they're not going to be able to do until this term, this this last term that we're talking about, which is, of course, after the election. So Alabama draws a map that has six white, district, white majority districts, one black majority district. Um, the district court has said it's unconstitutional, or not unconstitutional, it it's, uh, violates the Voting Rights Act. And the Supreme Court says, we're going to let that map go into place for the 2022 election anyway, before we decide whether it actually violates the Voting Rights Act. Really big deal. <laughs> Uh, so going into the 2022 election, Alabama ha elects, surprise, six Republican representatives and one Democratic representative on the map, which the court then, surprise, says is actually a violation of the Voting Rights Act. This is one of the 5-4 decisions where the three liberal justices got two justices, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh, who joined and said, yeah, this violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. So we're not going to stop the map from going to effect to the election, for the election, but then we're going to go ahead and say it was an illegal map. So Alabama elected new representatives on an illegal map in the 2022 election. Really interesting, kind of wild and crazy thing. By the way, the blocking the lower court's ruling was based on what's called the Purcell pr Principle. The Purcell principle says we're not going to do anything to change election law too close to the election. That principle had normally been applied where it was things like we're six weeks from the election, we're eight weeks from the election, we're two and a half months from the election. This was eight months from the election. So now the Purcell, now there is precedent to use the Purcell principle to not make changes to election law eight months before an election, which is another interesting election law development. Um, this, is, this was a real big surprise because from the not blocking the district court's decision and then from the oral argument, everyone was guessing that people were going to say, that, that the court was going to say this does not violate Section 2 and that this would be another decision that undermines Section 2 for governing uh, redistricting. But they didn't do that. Um, so that's a big win for voting rights and, the, and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, but a surprising one. And the way it played out, like I said, it means that an illegal map went through the 2022 election, which is a little troubling, but that's a huge case. Uh, by the way, there was additional ongoing controversy because after the Supreme Court said this map does violate Section 2, Alabama went back, redrew essentially the same map, and then tried to implement that, basically defying the Supreme Court. 
Um, it was again held unconstitutional, not unconstitutional, again held a violation of the Voting Rights Act by the district court. An emergency stay went up to the Supreme Court, and this time the Supreme Court said, no, you kind of have to do what we say, <laughs> Alabama. Um, and so they, uh, this time, allowed the district court's uh, injunction against the map to go into effect, and they'll have to fix it. They'll have to do something to fix it. But really big controversy because we essentially had a state legislature defying the Supreme Court's decision openly. Um, all right, the last election law case uh, is the Moore versus Harper. This is the independent state legislature theory. Um, this came up, well, it came up the first time in Bush versus Gore. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist floated this theory um, 20, what is that now, 22 years ago. Uh, the independent state legislature theory says that the Constitution refers to state legislatures having the power to re regulate federal elections, um, and the <clears throat> the way it came up in Bush versus Gore is the Florida Supreme Court was trying to overturn, um, I think, a, some kind of deadline that the Florida legislature had imposed on recounting ballots in the Bush versus Gore election in 2000. And Chief Justice Rehnquist had said, you know, I don't know if the Florida Supreme Court can even do that because under the Constitution, which gives the power to the state legislature, the state legislature has that power and the state Supreme Court can't do anything about it. That was the theory. That's come up a couple more times now, and it came up again in Moore versus Harper. The, uh, what happened is the North Carolina state legislature, which was uh, uh, dominated by the Republican Party, uh, drew a map that uh, gave, even though the state of North Carolina is fairly evenly split between Republicans and Democrats, the map drawn by the Republican legislature gave 10 out of 14 seats to the Republican Party. So the Democratic Party challenged this under state law, not federal law. The North Carolina Supreme Court, which had a slight Democratic majority on it, overturned the Republican legislature's map saying, under state law, not federal law, but under state law said, this is illegal map um, because it's, part of, it's a partisan gerrymander. And then the challenge was, can the state Supreme Court overturn the state legislature's map if the state legislature is the one that is given constitutional power to regulate elections under the independent state legislature theory. Does that make sense? So uh, this was brought up a couple of years ago before we had the new Roberts Court, before Barrett was on the court. So we had Kavanaugh, so there was a 5-4 court, but uh, a new 5-4 court, Kavanaugh was still relatively new. It came up and the court sort of kicked it away. I think there was a, I think it might have been standing. <laughs> Let's say it was standing, because that, that's fun. Um, but it, it was, it, they kicked it away without deciding the independent state legislature theory. Now, with Barrett on the court and six conservatives in the majority, this independent state legislature theory comes back up again, new court, new briefing, and the court uh, says, six to three, Chief Justice Roberts, yeah, actually, the new, new North Carolina Supreme Court can overturn what the North Carolina legislature, in other words, six to three, against the conservative argument for the independent state legislature because the liberals got three justices to swing over. Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kavanaugh, and Justice Barrett all joined the three liberals to say no to the state legislature theory, independent state legislature theory. Huge, huge surprise to everybody. Um, and a big win in terms of governing, like imagine if, the Texas Supreme Court could not say no to the Texas legislature when the legislature wants to do something with voting and the Supreme Court can't do anything about it? That's weird, right? Nevertheless, that was the theory. It was rejected by a 6-3 uh, decision, but not the 6-3 you would assume. Instead, it was uh, a different 6-3. Um, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, and Justice Gorsuch dissented. That all comes from a pretty hardcore you know, strict textualist originalist reading saying if the Constitution refers to the state legislature having that power, then that's who has the power. Um, anyway, huge voting rights case. Uh, coming up this term, whether Chevron should be overruled. <laughs> like I said, this is the administrative law term right now. Chevron, uh, the non-delegation doctrine is another administrative law doctrine that's now before the court, which the non-delegation doctrine essentially says Congress does not have the power to delegate power to agencies, which means administrative agencies can't exist. 
right? Big administrative law cases. Like I said, let's just quit teaching that for a while. Let's wait and see what the court says about stuff. Gun safety laws, public officials on social media, whether they can block people on social media. That's a big First Amendment case. Lots of other stuff on redistricting. Big term that we're in right now. That's all I've got.